Propaganda by the Seed is a joint collaboration between Edgewood Nursery and the Soulcast. To get 10% off of your Edgewood Nursery order of plants, seeds, and trees, visit edgewood-nursery.com and use Soulcast at checkout. And if you want to support the Soulcast, you can go to patreon.com forward slash S-O-L-E-O-N-E. Now before we get into this episode, let's hear from some comrades in the Channel Zero Podcast Network. Hi, I'm Eamon from the Radical People podcast on Channel Zero Network. Did you know that the Earth First Journal is turning 40 years old this year? If you're not familiar, the Earth First Journal is a radical print magazine committed to reporting on resistance and defense of the wild. For four decades, they have covered everything from forest defense and sabotage to street demonstrations and lockdowns. If you are interested in reading and supporting the journal, as well as getting some history of Earth First, Buy a one-year subscription now and get the 40th anniversary issue upon release this summer. And if you'd like to receive a 20% discount on a year-long subscription, upon checkout, enter the promo code EFJ40THCZN. sent to your house can you will you um you know i'll give you a copy and i'm like oh, cool. you know, i'll get like unreleased dj promos but what he didn't say is that he told them that my address was wmpg and so all the hip-hop for wmpg was coming to my house and when i was in high school oh my God, wow you know well, made me really cool because it was before the internet it was like i had all this like unreleased naughty by nature or whatever wild i um Whenever I would go out and see a band, I would ask them for some music and for WMPG, and then I would bring it to them. <laughs> <laughs> I literally just... No, I would have it so um, so Because we're, it was so, you know, pounding on us, like, you cannot, you have, if you're acting, you have, you know, it's like, oh, 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 my job. I didn't realize it was, like, a no, scam. Of you did. I didn't realize this guy was, like, a really yeah. scam. I do miss going there at 2 4 o'clock in the morning and every other Friday. I think the, the thing that trips me out about, like, community radio like that, especially if you have a 4 a.m. time slot, is, like, is anybody actually listening? I always wonder that, but people call in all the time. During okay. my 4, it was, it was um, 4 to 6 30. Yeah. So it's so kind of like podcasting. I would, <laughs> yeah, I would hear people call in. And then um, I did, I had a photography show of photos I took in Haiti. So I framed them out at all these photos. I had a show, and all the money was going toward Haiti. And I announced it. My friend from Haiti came on the show with me in the morning, and we talked about it. And they were and of course, it was, it was at UFF, and it was, like, not like we heavily marketed it, but... There were several people there I didn't know. I'm like, so how'd you know about this? You know, and they were like, I heard about it on WMPG this morning. Oh, that's cool. That morning. Cool. And, yes. um, uh, yeah, and so, uh, two people bought something. So that was great. Yeah. Right. yeah. There you go. WMPG. Yeah. They, yeah. I haven't listened people much listening. recently. They used to have some wild shit on there. Like, the... Church of the Subgenius radio oh, show. Right. Yep. Do you know about yep. the Church of the Subgenius? It is bizarre. There's, there's some it's some uh, interesting shows. It's like kind of a joke cult. Uh-huh. Um, and the the like prophet or whatever is this uh, like 50s caricature of a guy who likes smoking a pipe. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> And his name's like Bob or his something. His name's Bob. 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 Yeah. Bob, the Saint of Sales. Oh wow! And it's it's all like kind. Of, it's very tongue in cheek, and it's the you know it's it it's presented as a cult basically. But the idea is like the the guiding principle is to basically just be chill. <laughs> like yes. the the followers of the subgenius 
like their their greatest uh, goal in life is to have this thing called Slack. Slack. Just, yeah, let's bring Slack back. Very very much like dudism, uh-huh. like the the faux religion based on um, the dude from Big Lebowski. Big Lebowski. Yeah. Alright, well, so I think I've got everything rolling and levels more or less where they should be, and awesome. I think, uh, let's go. Alright, we are here at, in the secret back headquarters of Edgeward Nursery with Lisa Wiley, Acorn. Acorn Extraordinaire. It, it, not that it matters that much, but it's actually Lisa Willie. Oh, that matters. <laughs> That matters. Well, I've been called Wiley my whole life, so I, I, it is Willie. Well, I aspire to be Wiley <laughs> <laughs> and Willie, I guess. Um, well, how are you doing today, Lisa? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day here, in the Secret Grove. Yeah, we we are outside Ash here, Grove. Uh, socially distanced, but finally recording in person again. Uh, so if you hear tons of crickets and birds, um, that that is why. It gives a nice outdoor ambiance. Yes. Yeah, apologies. If it's so hard to think with all this fucking racket. <laughs> <laughs> I just wish nature would shut the fuck up. <laughs> it's so gross and loud out here. Ugh. It is gross. Uh, nice and dry, actually. Just... <laughs> <laughs> nice and dry. Almost nice. a little too dry. <laughs> Slightly haze-filled I, sky. I call it a drought. <laughs> I'm, I'm inhaling particulates from yeah. miles away. Yes. Well, yeah. The uh, the sunrises and sunsets have been very red. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> and it's weird to be here in the east where our problems are. They it makes the the drought that we've had seem like not so bad mm. when the other coast is literally on fire. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. It is. That's crazy. Yeah, I was like, I, I was having really bad allergies all weekend, and like I couldn't find any information. I was like, it seems like it would be the fires affecting us mm-hmm. over here. And like I couldn't, and just today was in the paper, and I was like, why didn't you tell us that like three days ago? Like people have been coughing and shit. Like we got a plague we're concerned mm-hmm. about too. Yeah, exactly. And they actually have the plague too in California. Oh, yeah, the literal plague. The literal plague. Yeah. Thanks, 2020. (laughs) (laughs) We got COVID. We got rising fascism. We have locally droughts, other coast fires. Right. And uh, then they, Florida, would they just get four months of rain in four hours or something? Oh, yeah. Two feet of rain Mm -hmm. on the Gulf Coast. Um, We would have gladly split that rain with you, Gulf Coast. Mm. Yes. Um, but, yeah. So, everything's pretty fucked up. But, you know, I have been seeing that is hopeful and um, nice to see, unlike all those other things, uh, is some acorns falling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And at first I was like, wow, is this just, like, drought stress that these acorns are dropping? So I broke a few open and they were actually full. So yeah. it's uh, it is prime time for for collecting acorns and we've we've been meaning to do this podcast for a few weeks now so that it would come out well ahead of acorn season um but we didn't didn't get around to it and um part of that was we we were hoping to feature a indigenous voice on the topic of acorn um collecting and processing um but we weren't able to find anyone so if out there in in podcast land there um is anybody who uh, is an indigenous person who would be interested in talking to us about acorns. We would love to follow up this episode um, with uh, your perspective. Yeah. Uh, speaking of hearing the acorns falling, my cousin, our cousin from California, just came out here in a van and he parked on the edge of our woods and was basically awoke constantly and kind of afraid because he thought he was hearing gunshots and he lives in Sacramento. So, uh, it was acorns hitting the metal roofs. 
Yeah, I'm I'm familiar with that sound. Uh, yeah, the acorns haven't really been dropping where I live yet. It's I don't know why, but I haven't really seen many. I've only seen a few. So interesting. I don't hmm. know. Well, I think that maybe they drop at different rates due to different conditions. Um, I two years ago harvested in November in Massachusetts picked a lot that had just fallen so yeah I think it's because it's like thick forest behind my house where you harvest them and so it's like they probably just haven't hit their stride yet or something Uh, then I have a huge I have an acorn tree in front of my house that makes like three inch long acorns and um I don't know. It's like infested with brown tail moth. So we'll see if I get any this year. Mm. If not this year, it's fucking. It's gone. Right. Are they really long and skinny? Yeah. Uh, they're not skin. They're kind of skinny. Yeah. They're thin. Mm. They're like oval. Interesting. I should have brought one. There was. I was I looking at one you said. Like, white oak, but. Yeah, I was just from bigger, but. Um, I'm trying to remember the common name. I think it's. I think the uh, botanical name is Quercus Montana. Um, chestnut oak has <laughs> has really long acorns, and they're they're around. There's not many in Maine, but you can do it. Right. I mean, I suppose them. it could be something somebody planted before. Right? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is in front of a house. Yeah. This one's a special one. Okay. Yeah. But. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like uh, we were saying earlier, like I read about, I had never even thought about acorns until I read uh, Octavia Butler, mm. Parable of the Sower, and like acorn bread and acorn food was like a central diet uh, diet item of like this post-apocalyptic collapsed society. And, uh, you know, <laughs> no better time than the present to learn that, I guess. Yeah. I heard about that book from you, so I I got it immediately after we talked about it, and it was really interesting to see uh, the little short discussions, references to acorn bread and acorn flour. Um, yeah, really good book. Well, so how um, like how did you stumble onto eating acorns? You've been eating acorns since the eighties, right? <laughs> No. Way before 90s. it was cool. Way yeah, before, way it, was before cool. it was cool. No, this would or be the ultimately 90s. after it was cool. Uh, after it was like, <laughs> um, I heard. I just heard. Um, just some book I read somewhere. I'd heard somebody mentioned eating acorns. Um, I don't think that it ever really got covered in like history class or whatever because it was such was and is such an important diet to even like paleo people all over the world so I didn't really think about it and I saw a a book by a children's author named Jean Craighead George and it was I think it's called wild wild food or something but it was really meant for children and families and I found a base a simple recipe for processing acorns so that's what I've been doing with a nutcracker Hanging out at your son's yeah. game. Hanging out at soccer games. and uh, But I've since expanded from the basic pancake. So, yeah, that's how I first heard about it. Yeah, maybe we should just go over a little bit about acorn processing and, like, why, why you can't just eat acorns off the ground. Mm. Um, and that... I guess I can talk about that. Um, so all of the acorns that are found in this part of the world, um, and generally acorns worldwide, um, have quite a bit of tannin in them, um, which is a type of acid um, that makes them pretty unpalatable to humans. And a lot of animals that eat acorns are totally fine with that. Um, but if you want um, to eat acorns yourself, you need to leach out that tannin. Um, and that usually just involves, you know, cracking them open um, so that you can soak them in water um, and that removes the tannin. And it usually takes several changes uh, of water. And the more you grind the acorns up, the faster it goes because it has a lot more surface area. Um, and we can talk more about how, uh, like, different ways that you can do that. Um, but that's kind of the gist of it. 
can I ask a question? Um, tannins are they affect your liver negatively? Is that why we don't like them? The, yeah. Is that what, what yeah. happens? Uh, it's a, it's just work for your liver to process uh, harder work because it's not normally something we have high amounts of in our diets or tannins. Um, Animals have different ways of processing that. So and animals prevents, that eat acorns. And it prevents your body from absorbing nutrients? Is that right, correct? Right, it's called an anti-nutrient. Anti-nutrient. Anti so it doesn't necessarily harm you. It's more like you're not able to absorb nutrients. I guess. So we got to so get the tannins hard. out. Yeah. i got to get the tannins out. And also, it, they taste... Anything with high tannins, you don't want to eat it. Yeah, they taste... You don't taste want to eat a raw acorn. Terrible. Yeah. Um, and, but it is a case of, like, uh, the dose makes the poison. So a little bit of tannins is totally fine, and um, tannins are important aspect of, like, wine flavors. And um, fermentation, too, right? Tea, yeah, yeah. Yeah, There's, tea. Yeah. Um, so it, it's not like if you had a tiny bit of residual tannin in, um, in your acorn flour or whatever that it would be a problem it would hurt you if if the flour tastes okay you've gotten out plenty of the tannins okay. so that it's safe to eat um, you would it's kind of like if you're familiar with making fermented foods like if your ferment goes bad it's gonna taste so gnarly that you would never eat it <laughs> um, so that's like one of the reasons that f fermented foods are generally quite safe Except for Rejuvelac, which always smells like shit, no matter how you <laughs> that's, that's true. It's not a great smell. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I threw it away like five times making it. I was like, this smells like shit. I've done something wrong. And then by the fifth time, I was like, it just smells like shit, I guess. Nice Does it shit. taste good? No. It... <laughs> oh, okay. It's like, beer. it's like beer minus beer plus a sulfur farty. Or like a dirty sock. Oh, that sounds you wonderful. Know, yeah. It's not a... Yeah. <laughs> I've made it before. It's not, but it also it's hard to get it right. So, well, it's easy for me to get it wrong, I guess. Too. So, um, all right. So you got the tannins out. Um, you have different ways of doing it. You like using hot water, right? So the, I, that was the way I learned. So that was the way I've done it for years. So I boil out the tannins. It takes a lot less time. You can do it. So I just kind of bring it all to a boil. The water turns like a dark color. Um, whole. You do it with whole acorns. Whole, right. Um, I've, yes, I've learned that the greater surface area, the better. So I try to do it a couple of different ways now. But way, the way I did it for years is cra throw those cracked acorns in a pot of water, bring it to a boil, rinse it, and do that a few changes until the water is more clear. And then you actually start sampling the acorn. And if it tastes, like as you were saying, if it starts to taste palatable, it's probably fine. And that's that's how I've done it, but there are other ways. Yeah, and I've heard one of the, um, the downsides of um, hot leaching is that you can't really dry out the acorns and store them. But it sounds like, um, what from what you were telling us earlier, that you actually can. Yeah. So that might be a... I then toast them. A, a bad piece of uh, conventional wisdom. Well, drying, the way I do it is toast them in the oven. Mm -hmm. So then I have these things. I, I find that um, because of like the fat content and stuff, I think that's what it is in the acorn flour. It can go rancid quick, pretty quickly unless you store it. If you store it in a jar in your pantry. But... I find that if I have these whole toasted acorns, then I grind as needed for flour, that they last longer. That makes a lot of sense. Yes, yeah. yeah, someone I was uh, talking, I was visiting someone, uh, he had a bunch of acorns, and he had like, you know, like acorns like you have in the jar, but like salt and vinegar ones mm. and like different flavors and would just eat them like nuts, which yeah. I think is a... a uh, also kind of interesting. Yeah, I have tried. I have tried um, those acorn nuts, and, I, and they're not really for me. Yeah, they were kind of tough. I didn't. It wasn't like something I'd want to yeah, eat a lot. Yeah, it, it, it's not really for me. Um, but that's. But I do think. Um, okay, what are they called? I haven't done a lot with this either, except when I made tempeh. Are the acorn keeping them whole? Um, I can't think of the term right now, but people can use them in stews. So you want, almost like a bean. Mm -hmm. So you're not whole, but like 
cracked so that they're chunks and you can you can put them in a um, in a stew and you have this soft but firm textured thing like a bean and then I also mix them with soybeans and made tempeh so f fermented the the acorn nuts very cool and the pieces the chunks and I liked that and were yeah. those hot leached because I've I've tried um, to cold bleach big chunks of acorn and they just never seemed to uh, fully leach out the tannins yeah I think these are probably hot leached yeah just because that's really my go-to I don't cool I and I don't know if that sacrifices some of the nutrient because you know depending on the type of acorn what tree it you know what type of oak it is depends on how much yeah nutrient it gets. I'm, I'm sure there's something that's getting Mm -hmm. cooked out but you the same thing happens with cold leaching you might be losing different different right. nutrients but with cold leaching because you basically have to like at least coarsely grind them up in order to get it to leach properly uh, there is a certain amount of um, you know nutrients that just get washed away in that process including yeah. some of the fat yeah so just for people who are listening to this conversation who aren't familiar with either method um, I feel like there's some like aspects of like cold leaching that are like that were pretty important like basically like after you've grinded them putting them you use a pillowcase yeah like I just yeah, use I, the t-shirt I'll, I'll walk you th through the the whole process from start to finish for how how I do it um, and I also put this stuff on a a web page that we'll link in the show notes um, for for reference and so you can see some pictures um, of how I do it and the tools and stuff. Um, so it starts with um, collecting the acorns, which you can do just by picking them up and putting them in whatever container or your pocket or whatever's handy. Um, if you want to speed that up, there are various nut gatherers. Um, if you want to spend a little money on equipment to, um, if you find that you're you're going to be collecting a lot of acorns, I, I find the equipment does make it... Um, a lot quicker and easier to harvest large amounts. And what's it called, like a nut buddy or something? Um, a nut wizard is wizard, one of them. Yeah. The one I, that I have is called a garden weasel nut gatherer. <laughs> yes. Which is pretty ridiculous. Um, and I got one, so I, I know you probably got one at Johnny's. I got one at through at Obishan. Yeah, like I got mine at Paris Farmers Union. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you can, um, there's like links on that webpage for where to find them. Uh, there's also... Um, a a cheaper one that I think it co costs like ten or fifteen bucks. Um, that it doesn't the the nut wizard is sort of a egg shaped rolling basket that you run across the ground, and the uh, acorns and acorn sized rocks um, kind of go into it, and then once it's full, you kind of pry the tines apart over a bucket. Um, there's another one that's sort of like a little metal hopper on a stick with little tines at the bottom. Uh, that's it's slower, but if um, you know if you just want something that's a little bit cheaper um, and a little bit more selective, but uh, doesn't require you to bend over all the way, I, I think that's still a useful um, a useful tool. Um, and when you're picking up acorns, there's a lot that you don't want. Uh, so any acorn that has a cap on it is generally not good to eat. Um, those um, are often parasitized by insects or the tree dropped them due to drought stress or just the tree set more acorns um, than they could really ripen. And so if, um, if they drop with the cap on, usually no good. If they're broken... Um, or like really discolored, that means they're probably have been sitting there for too long. Uh, and if they have a little hole in them, that indicates that there was an insect in there, which has since exited. So you don't want those ones either. Oh, I have found, yeah, it's better to get them with the newly hatched weevil because they haven't done the damage. And then you can just, some people eat them. Yeah. I don't eat my fish, but yes. Uh, and if you if you have acorns yeah. sitting around in your house, you will get weevil uh, larvae hatching out of them occasionally. Yeah. Um, yeah. The first time I had like baskets of acorns in my workroom, which is like the one whole room on the third floor of our house, 
we started finding all these little white grubs um, <laughs> in my partner's workroom, which is right below it. And we're like, where the hell are these coming <laughs> from? Um, and everyone but me was like really grossed out and like, this is the most annoying thing. I'm like, ah, yeah, whatever. But we eventually figured out it was the acorns. <laughs> Well, they kind of look like maggots. So yes, it's, yes, it's, yes you, absolutely. Nobody wants to see like maggots falling. No, 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 I definitely don't want to oh see gosh. it, but I'm less less troubled by it than some. Um, anyway, so once you've got your acorns, um, if if you pick them up with a, a nut wizard or something similar, you'll you'll end up sorting them um, as they come out of the collecting bucket, and the next uh, phase is to dry them. And if you have, like, drying screens or extra window screens kicking around, that's um, totally fine. But also any sort of shallow tray or shallow cardboard box or something. Because um, you, you don't want them, like, kind of stacked up or they won't dry well. So a single layer. Um, I use usually, like, um, the plastic trays that um, you might start seeds in or something like that just because I've got those handy. Um, and you want to dry them somewhere that has good airflow and um, where they'll be protected from rodents because if you do this outside um, the the rodents around will thank you for collecting mm. up all those nice acorns mm -hmm. for them and they'll just take them uh, once they're dried in the shell they're basically shelf stable um, so if you're going to store acorns long term that's probably the best way um, I've heard they store for between two and five years in the shell um, so a pretty excellent, um, like high calorie food, um, to have sitting around and then you can process a batch at a time whenever, um, you want to, or you have time or whatever. Uh, I usually mostly do the processing in the winter when I'm less busy. Um, and then when it's, when you're ready to process a batch, um, you take your dry acorns and the next step is cracking them. And you can crack them between like two rocks or a rock and a hammer, a piece of wood and a hammer, um, using a hand nutcracker. Um, or if you want to do a lot quickly, you can get a Dave built nutcracker, which um, is like a metal nutcracker with a hopper and a rotary crank um, that you can do. I don't remember how. All right, we did a. We'd, Aaron and I did a thing last year where yeah. we measured how long it took us to process a certain amount. It was very uh, fast. Going to your acorn class was probably my favorite <laughs> oh, my good. favorite thing I, I went to. Like uh, these two did a hosted an acorn class together mm -hmm. and it was just just blew my mind. I mean, like, because I've been reading about doing it forever, but it's like until you actually like for me, like I have to like with with forage stuff, I like to be with people who've done it and like ask all the annoying questions and right. so it was like just just blew my mind and then you had all this create all this it food was really was like, fun so to, cool to create the food yeah uh so I, I did find my notes here and uh it took five minutes to crack about six pounds of acorns so really really quick compared yeah. to doing it by hand yeah yeah to, to do it by hand with my little 20 dollar amazon thing cost me like took me like for five pounds. It probably took me four hours. Yeah. So if, if you want something to keep your hands busy, that's awesome. If you want to get a lot done, a, a Dave built does does that very nicely. It's a fairly expensive piece of equipment in the scheme of things. It's like a couple hundred bucks. Um, but it does work so fast that you could easily share one between a bunch of people. Yeah, for sure. Um, or if, if you have a tool library or a, a public library that's getting into sort of alternative things that are not, you know, books and media, um, that might be a, a great thing to suggest um, for people to have access to. Um, once they're cracked, uh, if you're doing it by hand, this usually is an issue, but with the date built, sometimes you get acorns that crack perfectly in half and leave the, the nut meat kind of stuck in the shell. Um, and the way that I deal with that is I just take handfuls of the cracked nuts, usually wearing gloves, and just kind of rub them between my hands. Um, and that usually frees up a lot of the kind of stuck um, nut meats. Um, and then I dump them in a big bowl of water or a bucket of water. And you'll see most of the shells will float to the top. And I skim those off and I kind of check to see if there's any that have uh, decent sized pieces of nut kind of stuck in the shell. 
uh, and then those go in the compost. And then I drain off the water and um, kind of pick through the nut meats because there's always some fragments of shell that wind up in there. Um, because mostly what I'm making is flour, um, I don't worry about tiny fragments of shell because if you get some tiny fragments of shell ground up in your flour, it doesn't really affect the quality and it's not going to hurt you. Um, so I'm, I'd am i rather you know, save a few minutes than worry about getting every last tiny fragment. Um, and then um, once you've got clean nut meats, you can grind them up. Uh, if you have a decent blender, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, but a like a hand crank um, gr grain mill works really well too, like a Corona type mill. Um, you can get an off-brand one for around 20 bucks on eBay. Um, so that's a, a nice piece of hand-driven equipment to have for a few different projects. Um, and you can grind up some pretty rugged stuff with those. Like if you um, collect medicinal mushrooms, like artist conch or reishi mushrooms, um, and then cut those while they're fresh into kind of strips. Um, you can then break those up into chunks, uh, or chaga it also works on, and then you can run the chunks through a burr mill, um, and that stuff like would absolutely destroy it, even the nicest blender. Um, but mm -hmm. the, the, the green mill handles it really nicely. Um, so then you've got, if, if you did it in a blender, you do it wet. So you've got this like acorn mush. Um, and my leaching method is to um, put all that mush in a clean pillowcase. And then I put the clean pillowcase in a five gallon bucket of water. <clears throat> and I let it sit for between 12 and 24 hours. And I lift the pillowcase out, dump the water, and repeat. And it usually takes around five changes of water uh, to get them leached down to the point where they're um, ready to eat. Um, and that sounds like a lot of work. Um, it kind of is, but when you compare that to, say, growing grain, uh, it seems like an amazing gift. <laughs> um, because if you had to like prepare a field and plant it and water it and protect it from pests and harvest the grain and thresh, weeding. thresh the grain and winnow it, um, you would end up doing a lot more work than just collecting acorns and processing them. And sometimes like when I work with acorns, for me, it's uh, almost a chance to sort of slow down. Nothing is fast about acorns. Yeah. collecting even if you've got a nut wizard which I just got for the first time last year uh, even with all the additional methods um, and equipment it still is a slow uh, it's a time to appreciate slow down I guess <laughs> yeah it's it's definitely not it's not fast shouldn't be in in a rush mm -hmm. um, but it's very pleasant work mm, it is um, and very conducive to, you know, doing with a friend or with several friends or while you're listening to a podcast or whatever. Yeah. Uh, good, good, it was, good it was busy a, work. It was a favorite activity with my son last year. He was two and a half and he just loved it. He just couldn't get enough of it. Like it was so, like we, 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 the whole process. And I think like one thing that's like a thought I've been having about just homesteading in general is like. You know, tip when I first got into growing food, I was like, okay, I'll grow tomatoes because tomatoes are so expensive and it's like worth the money or whatever. But some things, it's like it's kind of fucked up to like organize all these activities in the, in the, um, from like a home economics perspective because we want to like be outside of capitalist organized time. You know, we want to be free from that stuff. And, uh, and it's like you can't really quantify the experience of like putting yourself in this practice that people have done for a hundred thousand years mm -hmm. as a as a way to produce some food that you could never even taste, you know, in under normal circumstances mm -hmm. in cities and it's like the most abundant protein source that's all around us. Well, and, even in cities, you know. 
there's usually plenty of oak trees. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, like Please restaurants. Like, oh, you can't, restaurants. Like, right, you can't go right, to Subway right, and be like, right. yeah, I'll have an acorn right. patty on my... <laughs> <laughs> you know what's interesting is I have heard that if you want to buy processed acorn flour, because it's actually commercial in Greece, Italy, Asia... Yeah, Korea. Uh, commercial. So you, if you want to find some processed acorn flour... People say, like, go to a bigger city that has a lot of, um, like, Asian food markets, and you might be able to find a bag of acorn flour. Yeah, I've seen it at, um, um, I can't remember the name of the Asian market, because they don't have a sign, um, but one of the Asian markets on Forest Ave. Oh, okay. Um, One on Veranda? No. I I feel like they go to that one, uh, but I've heard it's good. No, it's actually on Forest Ave, like, across the street from Baxter Woods. But they had, like, oh. a uh, um, a bag, and it said acorn starch. So I don't know if it's different from, like, flour, but flour is mostly starch. Yeah, I think it's probably so, the but flour. But I think that's probably it. And a few years ago, I was looking at some places in Greece to Woof, which is the worldwide organic... It's a... Willing workers on organic farms. Is that what, <laughs> is yep. that what it is? Okay. Um, so I was looking at some places, and one was an acorn farm. I don't think they call it a farm, but and that's what they needed people to do is like cool gathering acorns and processing them on on a semi-industrial scale. Yeah, yeah. yeah it so still it's really, it's, still happens. Um, I think the the sort of central centers of acorn cultivation on on a large scale are Korea and Italy. Hmm. Um, there, there was another country I was reading about it recently, but I can't remember. Um, and then on this sort of like homestead or small community scale, I think there's people collecting and eating acorns all over the Northern Hemisphere. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously like pre-industrially, it was much more like a part of everyday life for lots and lots of people. Mm-hmm. Yep. And in places where oaks um, were abundant, you know, potentially like one of the major staples for people. For sure. I, I know in California, oh, um, right, right. Pre, pre-colonial indigenous people um, heavily relied on several species mm-hmm. of, of oak. In, um, in, in Italy, um, are they still, because originally they were used it as polenta before they found corn. Are they still using it as polenta in Italy? Ooh, that's I don't know. It's true. I do know that Absolute Vodka brand has, uh, in other parts of the world, an acorn flavored. You know how they have citrus Wild. and all that? <laughs> they have acorn. an acorn one. Very interesting. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and there's other, like, also acorns are used to um, finish um, hogs in a lot of places. Mm. So as, like, animal food is another big, big acorn use. Uh, so, like, the famous Iberico ham um, from Spain is all finished on, like, natural or semi-natural oak forest. Oh. Getting back to the processing just for a second. Mm. Um, once you've leached out all the tannins in, like, five or six changes of water, um, I usually hang that pillowcase full of acorn flour up to like drain as much as it possibly can drain so for several hours and then I spread the flour out on cookie sheets um, and since I usually do this in the winter uh, I put them in the room where our wood stove is so it's like hot and dry um, and they dry just fine um, you know probably wouldn't want to have it any deeper than an inch and I try and stir it around every day um, so that it dries before it gets a chance to mold. But once it's, like, air dry, um, then it, it's ready to, like, put in a sealed container and store. So you store in, not in the freezer or whatever, you store in a pantry. Okay. Yeah. And how long do you usually have that finished flour storing for? I try and use it up, use up a batch in, like, less than six months. Okay, so that's actually a while. Yeah, and I'll, I'll bet it could go a year if it was, like, in a sealed container in the freezer. Okay. Um, also, I, because I don't want to lose lots of, like, fine particulates or oils um, out through that pillowcase, I try and do, like, a pretty coarse grind. So even a little bit more coarse than, like, um, like grits. Um, 
So there's, you know, still the occasional little chunk in there. Um, and I find that to be really nice, um, cooked as a, like a hot cereal. So I'll like mix, uh, 50%, um, like steel cut oats and 50% coarse ground leached acorns, uh, as a hot cereal, often with like, um, ground up dried fruit too. Uh, that sounds I, great. <laughs> and I, I eat that like most cold mornings. Um, and then if I want to make something that's like, you know, pancakes or bread or something where you really want like a flour texture, I'll, um, re-grind, um, that coarse grind into flour mm. and it just takes like a couple minutes in the blender. That sounds really good. It sounds, you know, sometimes oatmeal doesn't, for me, it doesn't stick to my ribs for very long. Acorns I think an really acorn, stick to your ribs. Acorn and oatmeal. I'm going to try that. There's more, yeah, more protein, more fat. Yes. Um, yeah, it's, it's very nice. And that's a huge range. I actually, um, I actually taught, I based, I taught ecology at a charter high school last fall and I based my entire lessons on the acorn. So everything was based on the ecology of acorns. And so some of the figures are so high, so the, the range, so for fats, depending on the acorn, 1.1% uh, to 31.3%. So wow. it's a huge range. That is a huge range. <laughs> uh, with protein, it was 2.3 to 8.6%. And then for carbs, it was 32.7 to 89.7. So, so is it more comparable really to like chestnuts then, as far as its protein content? Like, do you know what the protein content of an almond or a cashew? I Not don't. Off the top of my head. But um, but yeah, it just depends on. Well, so they're talking about like you know the different types of acorns, and I think that's kind of worldwide an acorn. There's uh, like over 700 species worldwide of acorn of oak. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, oaks are very widespread yeah. and have like a really interesting botanical history. Um, if if you want to nerd out on oak taxonomy and evolution, um, there's an episode mm -hmm. of uh, the In Defense of Plants podcast. Mm, that's a good one about oaks. That's very nerdy but very interesting. Yeah. Uh, if you want to go down that rabbit hole, yeah. Um, and just to throw it out there, like here. Um, uh, where we all live, uh, we're mostly harvesting uh, Quercus rubra, the northern red oak. Uh, and there's some of um, the white oak around and various other species, but the uh, the red is the most abundant, and their their shells are a little bit more floaty than the other species, so it makes them a bit easier to process. We, we like that yeah. the floaty shell. Um, speaking of the white oak, the Corcus alba, the, so supposedly that one's sweeter, but the red oak is going to have more of the nutrient value that we want. So. Yeah, I've heard the a lot of the like supposed sweetness of the white oak is a really high fat content mm. that kind of masks yeah. the tannins. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they're um, they're also pretty difficult to harvest comparatively because that really high fat content is like the shit for rodents like that's what they want <laughs> everybody wants that right one. before winter is those really fatty acorns so they pick them up like nobody's business whereas the red oaks um will often sit on the ground for weeks or months uh, which gives you a lot better chance to collect them. To collect, and they're pulling away. What do you call it? Floating, pulling away from the inside of the shell. Uh, near the school, we have is Deering Oaks Park, so I would take the kids over there to collect acorns. And mostly, what we found were pin oak acorns, which are beautiful. Do you know what? They're, you know. they're very small. They have stripes. They're, they're gorgeous. gorgeous, but there's just very Nothing little there. nut in there. So the kids in the room were taking their, they came up with this innovation of a heavy metal water bottle <laughs> and they would lay it on the desk and just be like, smash, smash, smash. So yeah, kids, um, do love in my experience, um, working with acorns and seem to prefer the hands-on like, yeah. um, yeah. cracking them with 
two rocks, picking them up by hand, sorting the pieces by hand. Um, so while, while I might get bored after an, an hour of that, um, they often are all about it. So uh, one like, question slash point is um, there the um, the acorns have little red um, skins on them mm. and um, I, how do you like we I just mine just came off in the water yeah um, but like in general like those have tannins in them and people don't want to eat those or like what are your opinions right, on and the I think red they skin? can like you said they just come came off in the water right so if you're doing a hot leech which is boiling them they're just floating to the surface and I, you can just skim them off. I guess so I, guess I just means, wanted to mention that aspect yeah. of it because that was something I was like curious yeah. about when I was yeah. doing So just thinking about the acorns. That was when I had shell. to call tech support over here. Yeah. Like, hey, what do I do with these little red bags? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, I'm, I've never worried about them. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I think that we probably do end up eating them. I mean, right. I'm not picking every single one out, but mostly they float out in the water. Yeah. Also, when, when you grind them up, um, those little bits of, I think it's called testa, um, it just like disintegrates and floats off um, yeah. as you break up the nut meat. Um, it loosens it a lot. Yeah. So just mentioning. I mean, is there anything else about, uh, about harvesting and processing acorns that um, we should? I mean, like sometimes you know, if you open it up and it's black, you don't want to eat it. Oh yeah, yeah. If it's like obviously spoiled, right. right. And I, but I've even been desperate enough to go. Okay, well then the worm only ate half this. I'm gonna keep it. <laughs> a big chunk, you know. So I think, yeah, there's that. Um, I mean, I think you can tell just by looking. I mean, just like using your yeah, um, the common sense. Common important. sense that like this is probably no good. I guess I'm just trying to think of like all the like things yeah. that like were popping into my head the first time I did it yeah. that I wasn't really clear on. Right, whatever. and I think there's. So many different ways of gathering and cracking the nuts that, um, and none of them are really wrong. It's just some of them are more time consuming than others. Yeah. Totally. And Aaron, you tried to use, uh, you tried to, uh, leach yours in a rat in the river, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, years ago, um, I went to the common ground fair, which I usually go every year. Um, but I took a, a little workshop with this guy, uh, Chris Knapp, uh, mm. from the Kobyashevik school, um, about processing acorns. Uh, and he mentioned, like, leaching acorns in, in a stream, because then you've got, like, this just flo constant flow of cold water. I was like, wow, that's, that's awesome. So I, I, like, cracked out a bunch of acorns that year and just put them in a mesh bag in the stream. And after, like, a month in the stream and, you know, checking them every few days, they had still not leached. Um, and I was like, wow, that's ridiculous. And so I did a little more research, and it turns out, like, the fluid dynamics of, like, a bag in a stream is the, the water just kind of goes, goes around them. them. Um, and so I, like, went back to Chris's design, which was, like, a piece of pipe in the stream and a five gallon bucket with some holes in the bottom and you put the acorns in there and that forces the water to like flow through. Um, and I tried that and that didn't really work um, because the chunks of acorn were too big. Do you think um, it has to do with the, um, you're talking about flow dynamics, do you think it has to do with the speed of water or? I don't, I don't think so. Okay. I, I think it was basically just that big chunks of acorn in cold water and I was doing this you know in the fall so the water temperature is like in the 40s mm -hmm. probably um, just like that temperature and that particle size of acorn just does not leach so I like worked out various problems that um, arose and just they never fully leached um, and then like I, I started just using the simpler pillowcase and bucket with tap water method. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is actually less work. You know, maybe maybe if I was trying to do it on some sort of industrial scale or like, you know, if I was trying to do a thousand pounds of acorns, I would I would go back to that. Right. Like, trying to figure that one out. Try and yeah. figure it out. Um, 
but for the amount of acorns that I can reasonably eat, like doing a batch in a five gallon bucket Mm -hmm. is totally reasonable. Um, and like even, you know, shrinking that down, like if, if you're only doing a small amount, you can leach them in like a, a quart jar. I know lots of people who just leach in a quart jar and rather than having them in a bag, you just have your quart jar and you pour off the, um, the water that's all full of tannins until you start to see like the cloudy water that hovers on top of the ground acorns. And that's like where some of the fat is sitting. So when you start to see that pouring out, you stop, refill the jar and that works totally fine too. Mm. I just found it easier to do one, one bucket rather than several jars over time. Okay. Um, one thing about acorns that I find really interesting um, and I think we should talk about is masting, mm-hmm. um, which is a, a strategy um, that some plants, especially oaks, use um, to minimize um, seed predation. Um, and what, what it means is that every two to seven years, oaks will make a very large crop of acorns. And then in the in-between years, uh, that and that like bumper crop is called a mast year. And then in the in-between years, they don't make very many at all. Um, and they're basically controlling um, the populations of the animals that eat those seeds. Um, and I think it's especially the uh, the acorn weevils that uh, are like they're so host host specific they only eat acorns so it's really easy for the uh, the oaks to kind of modulate um, their their population so over several years where there's not many acorns the population of acorn weevils is really gonna fall off and then the oak can make a giant crop of acorns and know that a lot of those acorns, there just won't be enough weevils to parasitize them. Um, and there have been some really interesting forestry studies done where I think more than 90% of the living oaks germinated in a mast year. Um, wow. So it really has a huge effect on, on the populations. Um, but it also has a big effect on collecting acorns. Yeah. So because they store really well, um, you know, over time, you're going to end up collecting most of the acorns that you eat if, if you eat uh, acorns on the regular in, in those mast years. And in years where there just aren't many acorns, you're not going to collect many acorns because they're just not there. Um, and there's some interesting little tidbits about that, which um, if you imagine a, um, a forest full of oak trees, if one oak tree doesn't make many acorns this year, but an oak tree that's 20 feet away does, it's not going to have any um, effect on the population of anything because the insects or rodents or whatever will just go to that other oak tree. So it has to be coordinated Mm -hmm. in order for it to work, at least on a regional basis. Um, And it's not, it's one of those things that is not scientifically explicable right now. We just don't know how the oaks are communicating or if it's like a sort of a complex algorithm of effects that um, that control this. Right. Okay. But um, it's it is a, a sort of well known phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And then there's the mycorrhizal mass. Mycorrhizal mass. The original <laughs> internet man. <laughs> the a couple of years ago, I went to so let's say 2018. I went, it was very low pickings. Everyone was talking about how there were just very few acorns. And then I happened to be at the Museum of Fine Arts, walking along the Fenway and on their lawn, and it was uh, covered, covered with acorns. So everywhere I went down there, so obviously, you know, there's a, there was a distance. So maybe, It's like you know, 100 miles Yeah, Austin. just talking about that community communities in one area of oak trees communicating somehow and then yeah well, do, doing do, something when that's a good like, as far as places you forage them like would you for like typically 
the knowledge I have is like if it's ten feet from the street, don't harvest it. Um, but because acorns are like falling from up on high, like do you think about that differently? Like, would you forage acorns in a city and eat them? I do. Uh, yeah, I do too. Um, <laughs> we did together in, yeah. <laughs> in Boston last year. Um, I I do, and then there's a lot to be said about. Um, I don't know. That's a whole subject about. Uh, you know, the uptake of heavy metals or toxins or whatever from plants and, you know, all of that. That's a whole other subject. But I do, I also feel that I'm exposed to a lot of just from the air I'm breathing. So I, I guess I, it came, I, had a bunch, I had a bunch of autumn olives that I harvested from like right next to like this kind of busy street and all my homies were like, don't eat that shit, you know? And I was like, Okay, you know, but yeah. it's just, I don't know. I mean, would you eat autumn olives, like, you know, harvest them off the highway or something? Well, I harvest them from my post office parking lot, um, which is really not really close to 302. Um, but. I would. You would? <laughs> All right, well, yeah. good enough for me. And there's, there's a, like, there's, it's not just like, um, my you know gut feeling there's some reasoning behind it one of them things is like most of what you're worried about being picked up from the soil by plants that you're foraging is lead mm-hmm. lead and cadmium and things like yeah those heavy metals, and yeah. um the conventional wisdom is that those heavy metals don't accumulate in reproductive structures so if it's fruit like autumn olive it's probably doesn't have much of any of that in there anyway. Um, or if it's like a um, acorn, also a reproductive structure, it's a seed, so it's not hopefully going to have any of that heavy, heavy metals in there. Um, and then the acorn, you're discarding the outside, so if there's any like surface contamination, you're getting rid of that anyway. Um, one thing that I would recommend when harvesting from a, like a roadside is to wash it. Um, because some a, a form of pollution that is coming off of roads is tire dust. And also pesticides, too, probably. Mm-hmm. Potentially, yeah. Um, and tire dust has cadmium in it, and it's gross, but it washes off. Um, so if if you're you know foraging and you're right near the road, yeah, I would definitely wash it, but I would still eat it. Yeah. Great. And maybe avoid, like, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't eat, like, nettles from like you know the side of a parking lot or a roadside in the city or whatever um maybe a or certain roots maybe yeah maybe certain roots or shoots yeah so anything that's like a vegetative structure roots shoots leaves stems probably wouldn't take from anywhere that seems like contaminated or gross reproductive structures nuts seeds Grapes. I harvest Fruit. grapes typically from near the road. Yeah. My, yeah, my grapes grow near the road. I, I don't have lead growing out of my head yet. Yeah. So that's that's kind of rule of thumb. And also, like, I eat conventionally grown produce. Mm. Right. A lot of that stuff has poison sprayed directly on it at some yeah. point. So but aren't we, like, directly right now? We're directly in the Gulf Stream anyway. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we're kind of getting it all anyway. Yeah. We live in a toxic environment. Yeah, the, the jet stream. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. 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 What did I say? Yeah. The Gulf Stream? Gulf Stream. Um, which okay, is not that the far from here. But yeah, yeah, we're currently inhaling the very watered down remnants of West Coast fires. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, we, we live in a toxic world and yeah. you do what you can. But mm-hmm. I, I think the benefits of harvesting wild or feral food kind of outweigh the risks and especially if you take some basic precautions like washing food. Yes. Yeah. Well, so I mean what is there anything do you, is there anything left to say about um like harvesting and preparing or should we talk about what to do, how to eat, how to Um one one other little tidbit on masting um so masting, I, th- I think I mentioned, is like probably caused by like pest pressure. It's like an adaptation to this pest pressure. Um, and I 
Now, I think I've even mentioned this on the podcast before, but I have heard what is basically hearsay that um, when there was regular fire being used to manage landscapes by um, indigenous people, burning up that leaf litter really, really reduced the pest pressure on yeah. acorns and burned up a lot of those acorn beetles that are like the number one um, seed predator of acorns. And supposedly um, during that um, historical period, acorns were largely annually cropping. So they weren't, they didn't need to mast because there wasn't that pressure from acorn weevils. And so there were a lot more acorns being produced in, in the woodlands. Um, while they were doing the burning. Yeah. That. While there was yeah. regular burning by indigenous people. Yeah. Um, and I was like, wow, that is fascinating. Um, never been able to track down any sort of <laughs> academic, um, source or anybody who could like, you know, speak further to that than basically what I just said. Um, so if anyone out there has more information on that, I would love to hear about it. Uh, there's also a whole now, again, I don't have the study in front of me, but I used it with my the kids last year on ticks and oak trees and you know, yeah. the whole relationship when you're talking about whether it's a mast year or not and the, the white mice that are eating the oak trees and the deer that are there. Oh, and interesting. So, yeah, that's something just, I think if you Googled all those words, tick, acorns, white-tailed deer. Yeah. I'm not allowed to Google ticks anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad, bad for your mental health. <laughs> yeah, so there is there's a whole whole connection with that, that thing, too. Yeah, I, years ago I started reading... Stephen Herod Buner's book Healing Lime. Mm -hmm. I got about ten pages into it, and I was like, I am so fucking stressed out by reading mm. this book. I need to stop right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's some crazy shit. Yeah. Um, also, a few years ago in in Maine, um, we had a weird thing happen, which was a double mast year. Mm. So we had two consecutive years with really heavy acorn production, um, and the next year, the squirrel population Ugh. was bananas. And probably the tick. Probably yeah, the so ticks, I too. Really I don't remember delicious. the ticks. Was that our, last year? I think it was two years ago My now. first year was crazy. My first year living here was a crazy tick year. But, but I remember driving down I-95, and, like, there was at least one squirrel roadkill every single mile. Mm. There were just everywhere mm -hmm. um and then that summer i remember seeing the squirrels eating the acorns like before they had filled up right. and sized so right. all of that winter yeah. food for squirrels um was eaten up during the summer because the population was so high mm -hmm. and the squirrel population absolutely crashed mm -hmm. yeah it's like a it's like the an episode in Jared Diamond Collapse. <laughs> My dog thinks he has something to do with it, but I don't know that he's ever done <laughs> <one>, so <laughs> he's taking credit for it. Um, yeah, like couple, as we were sitting here, I was thinking like things to try: acorn falafels and an acorn Ooh. vegan gravy. Right, like, because you know how you get those macrobiotic yeah. meals of like a cashew gravy. Yeah. Thinking like, okay, yes. I gotta try to make an acorn right. Thanksgiving, like yeah, fuck that up my family. Yeah, really good. I'll, <laughs> I'll try that. I'll try the acorn gravy. Um, what did you just say before that? Falafel. Falafel. That's a good idea. That and I amazing. thought of trying something with dosas, but I haven't yet. Mm. Um, I don't know. I don't know how that would work, but why not try? Right. Every, I mean, I tr I've tried a bunch of things that turned out okay. With the um, tempeh, fermenting them with the tempeh, and the cheese, um, acorn cheese, acorn nut cheese, um, sourdough. It was like a vegan <laughs> fantasy to be in that room and see. You had dock things. crackers. You had two different kinds of cheeses. You had one cheese that was covered, that was dressed with pine needles. Yes. And I was like, can you eat pine needles? I guess. You know? <laughs> They're high in vitamin C. Just bear that in mind. And then the other one was um, uh, another ch uh, acorn cheese with like 
brushed with like sumac and dried powdered mushroom it was like oh my god like my vegan nerd friends i wish they could because you know the thing is about being a vegan like you can travel to every city and eat the same whether it's some chinese shit or some burrito yeah, bean burrito or a fucking tempeh, a, a, a Reuben, a Reuben, or a, mm-hmm. here's our Philly cheese steak. You know, it's like, woo! You know, it's like, where can you go and have yeah. acorn pancakes? And uh, Only the, Lisa's house. The <laughs> acorn sourdough you made was like 75% acorn. It was. That, that was my favorite. It like, was if, really dark, too. It oh, it, it looked color. gorgeous, uh, and it was so tasty. And if, if I was going to, like try to have like an acorn based diet which i eat a fair amount of acorns but it's definitely not like a significant portion of my diet but that bread is i would eat that every day if i had enough acorns yeah it um because it has such (laughs) (laughs) also most of the foods that we're, we're talking about you can see photos of um on on that uh page that'll be linked in the in the show notes yeah. So yeah, can you talk about like some like how you've made some of this stuff and just like well, just... I really kind of experimented. Um, we talked about well, we haven't talked about him. Um, uh, there's a, a cookbook writer guy in Los Angeles named Pascal Bodar, and he eats a lot of wild food because where he is, you can find things all year long and. You know, I got some inspiration from him, but basically, um, I kind of started with that acorn sourdough. So I took, um, a sourdough recipe and cut most of the flour out of it and just tried, you know, I wanted to have some traditional wheat flour in there, but, um, just used, replaced it with acorn, acorn flour and it still, it did, it did the, it fermented, it did its thing and cooked up into a tasty bread. But you used a uh, wheat start, not a you didn't like have a start that began. Oh, my starter. Time. Yes, my starter was not um it no, it wasn't an acorn starter. I just used my regular wheat starter. Yeah. Cuz you probably couldn't do that, right? I don't know. Maybe I'll, I I don't know. That'd be an interesting experiment. Yeah, let's I try wonder it. I'll get to write notes here. I wonder <laughs> what the effect would be if you added acorn flour into the starter because you might be able to shift the biology of the starter a little bit Mm -hmm. so that it's you know breaking down something in acorn flour more yeah so you might wind up getting different flavors or something if you had that starter primed to like digest acorn true and (laughs) i mean i don't know that um scientifically speaking i mean i don't know if you need the gluten of wheat flour for the starter i don't know it's don't that you need so. it. i don't know that you need that starter to be glutinous i just think yeah just i've made a buckwheat starter before mm. um so why couldn't we do an acorn starter yeah yeah very next step and yeah sometimes they say to throw if you throw a fruit in it like speeds along the local mm. processes, right. so I so, uh, would consider it. Wild grapes right now are out there, and they have that yeast bloom on them, and they're an excellent way to get a starter going. So. Cool. I accidentally killed the starter my friend gave me, so it's time to yeah. kind of starter again. <laughs> <laughs> what about um, what about the cheese? What's your uh, method for making so cheese? The cheese, um, I... Which was delicious. Thank you. I ground the acorns to uh, not... I, I, I sort of did the process where you soak. So they were already had the tannins out. I had the chunks, which I soaked like you would making a cashew cheese. Mm-hmm. And then you grind that up when it's wet. So okay. I had this like pasty, doughy type of stuff. And then I added sour sauerkraut liquid um, or kimchi liquid. I'm not sure. I used either uh, some fermenting liquid. Um, and I remember I, I haven't Googled it, but it's like on my bucket list of things to Google this week. Like, can you eat those shoots of... Because, like, my neighbor, my friend, Kristen, who buys shit from Aaron, she was over, and she was like... Buy shit from Aaron. She buys plants from Aaron. She's a customer. <laughs> Just so Aaron knows, I'm talking about Anthony and Kristen. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, Anthony, who's actually 
whatever, amazing baker, amazing oh, okay. baker. He works at the main beer company, you know, whatever. He's oh. awesome. Um, but he, uh, she was like, she wanted to come over and pick horsetails to make, like, this bone-strengthening tea. Yeah, I see. I think they're more, like, I think of them more as medicinal, I guess. But a lot of medicinal shit you can just eat, too. Yeah, least, yeah. So I've learned. But yeah, so I don't know. I was just like, what the, I was wondering so if it eat more. the weeds... So what what I've heard about horsetail specifically is that it's like an amazing source of bioavailable silica, mm. which is why like you might want it if for bones, but especially for like hair and nails. Like if your hair breaks, supposedly horsetail is like an, an amazing thing for that. And people do teas, and How you can. How does it taste? Have you? Had it? I would say bad. I, was gonna I, say, I don't really like, like the flavor of it. I feel then. like I would go for. Just... Um. But they look like asparagus. I just, like... Yeah. yeah. I don't know. And there's there's also, like, two things. Like, there's the reproductive shoot that makes the spores, and then there's, like, the vegetative part. Um, so I don't, I don't know that much about it, but I know people like to put them in fermented teas to make plant sprays. Huh. Okay. Um, so you can, like, ferment the horsetail, um, or, like, you can do the same thing with nettle. And then you spray it on as a foliar spray, and supposedly it makes like a really tough cuticle on the plant leaf and makes them more resistant to um, like fungal infections. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, and another thing I've heard is if you want to ingest it yourself, is that you can juice it. So you juice the horsetail and eat it that way. Like now I've heard of yeah. people using it in its antimicrobial pop- properties in cleaning. Wow. That okay. doesn't sound like something you should be eating a ton of. <laughs> no, but yeah, so for, you know, like for vinegar. Yeah, like, further research necessary. Yes, yes. Yeah, so there's a there's a lot of interesting. But you know all that mugwort patch? He gave me a ton of mugwort from here, which I've since found growing on the side of the road. I made some. I made a lot of things with it, but I also made some ale. Wow. Yeah. It's it's good. God. It's amazing. You, you're cool. Lisa you're makes cool. all the cool stuff. <laughs> no. I know, I, I know, just, like, I have to leave at 12.15. I have to be oh, a parent. I don't um, But, um, it's 50 to a half hour. But I was like, I was, oh. me and Winston were hanging out in Wolf's Neck, just along the beach, just living in the desert for 20 years. Coming out here, just, it's like being oh, a child. Oh, where you live? In Colorado and Arizona. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. And, uh, but we're just, like, at the beach, and just, like, there's just fucking wild apples everywhere. Mm. And I'm like, you know, like... Say what you want about Zach, but there's one thing that guy did right. He made a lot of alcohol, and it's like just being, <laughs> being yes, on the beach, yes. being on the beach, and just seeing all these apples just fall, falling, mm. and like me and went, like we're just eating them and just like having fun, you know. And I'm like, yeah. dude, like these apples look like shit. They're all deformed, but these would make great yeah. fucking apple juice, apple cider. Last year, I went out for three hours in my car, and every time I saw an apple tree, I picked from it. If I saw one in someone's yard that didn't look like they were doing anything with, and I asked them. So I picked about five five-gallon pails of just wild apples in about three hours, and we made cider. Wow. Was, yeah. It was, it was... There's so much out there on the yeah, side. Yeah, and there's a lot of really cool uh, plants to forage that only grow on the coast. Like the native lovage only grows on the coast, and there's like beach peas... Mm-hmm. And glass wart, all sorts of really interesting stuff. I've looked oh, for yeah. glass wart. Uh, I find beach peas rocket. everywhere. Sea rockets really yeah. tasty. Sea rocket tastes crazy. Yeah. It's so musky. Yeah. Have you tasted glass wart? Yeah. Is it good? It's pretty good. Weird, right? Salty. It's, it's salty. Cool. Okay, so where were we? We were talking. Were we talking about cheese? Yeah, oh, cheese yeah, and just like all the so all the stuff you can make out of acorns. Right. Um, I am not as adventurous a cook as either of you. Um, so I eat like tons of acorn hot cereal. That's what I probably eat Mm. the most of with acorns. And that's probably really getting the benefit of the acorn, like to start your day with. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love it. Um, and my, like my family are like, eh, it's okay. Um, so it might be kind of, but it's, it's very much tailored to like my taste. Like it's got shizan- dried shizandra in mm-hmm. it and dried kiwis and, um, like all the weird dried fruit that either I put left in the dehydrator too long or it's just something strange. 
um, <laughs> that no one else wants to eat. I just grind it all up and put it in my hot cereal. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also like quick bread type things like pancakes, waffles, muffins, banana bread. All that's super easy to substitute, um, you know, 50-ish percent acorn flour. You could probably go heavier. Um, and it makes the uh, the finished quick bread like a little bit more dense. And it feels a lot more, um, or I would say less cracked out. It's like not like eating cake for breakfast. Oh, right. That's cracked out. I, had, I almost asked you what you meant by that. Yeah. I get it now. Well, those muffins I brought, um, uh, that was probably at least 75 to 80% acorn flour. Wow. Um, Acorns so, may be better than almond flour or these other nut flours. Maybe. I, I, they might be. I don't know. But also more, I mean, way more sustainable as far as that goes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like, there's these oak trees are generally growing happily with no input from humans mm. and providing a ton of ecological services to all the other animals, like, mm-hmm. you know, rodents and all sorts of animals that eat the acorns. Wild turkeys, that's like one of their major dietary. Wild animals. turkeys, and they host so many species of caterpillars. There's like a ton of different caterpillars that eat the oak trees. And then those caterpillars are food for basically all of our native birds. Mm-hmm. Um, so oak trees are like this amazing sort of key, keystone species of our um, ecosystem here. Mm. And not just here, lots of other places too. Right. But. And that's what you grow um, shiitakes on. Oh, yeah. Oak trees. You got so some at your house? I do. And this year was one of my best years mm-hmm. ever. Even my 12 year old logs were without any moisture input from me. That's amazing because it, it was like so the, dry. I, I, I usually two. do water to some degree, but I didn't. I didn't bother, I guess. You have a 12 year old shiitake log that still produces at your house? That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah I, I got so. two huge flushes of shiitake mushrooms out of my logs, and uh, yeah, I've never watered them. I yeah, wish. yeah, it I was want a to good do more. shiitake year. Nice. Yeah. Um, I felt like I had something to say about acorns. Oh, oh you, you know, can die with I died with the tannic, the water, the changing. Oh, cool. So going back to hot leaching. Uh, I saved um, the first two changes of water, and I used that to dye some fabric, and it was really beautiful. What about the coffee-like drink that um, I hear that some uh, indigenous people in North America ate? I heard that there was like a roasted acorn oh. kind of coffee-ish sort of drink. Do you know mm. anything about that? I, ever... I don't, but I why not? I mean, we make it. We have the mushroom. We have mushroom coffee-like drinks. We have root coffee like drinks i mean why yeah not an acorn i have oddly never made it but i do know, do know people who do a lot with acorns um uh, specifically this guy uh who was in sheboygan little john harvests tons of acorns processes a lot of acorns and if i'm rem- remembering correctly he said his favorite thing was like roasted acorn tea wow. yeah. basically that that coffee like drink i almost feel like that jar of roasted acorns maybe i should try making some yeah what about and and like you could probably just throw it in a smoothie too right have you ever done that you definitely could i don't know like might be a weird texture yeah i would it would have maybe a weird texture depending on how good your blender is like if you were able to blend it up to the point where it was like emulsified Mm -hmm. in the smoothie i i don't know what sort of benefit you might get from that other than like to say i did it yeah you could say, say <laughs> you could definitely say you did it and you did would definitely like you could de- take a smoothie from being like a very light meal to being like i ate this smoothie and i'm good for six hours yeah exactly like lumbus bread you could make oh you know yeah lumbus bread no i've never heard of it in lord of the rings the elvish whey bread that you could last for days on one piece that's sort of like your hot cereal sounds like. Yeah, very filling. 
like in our house we try to cook gluten free mostly and try to eat mm-hmm. gluten free mostly like we're not like celiacs but we right. just like it, right. it, it like yeah. agrees with us more um and so like having tried cooking with almond flour and um, other gluten free proteiny flours we actually really like cooking with acorn flour mm-hmm. i find it to be like somehow lighter and more flour like than almond flour yeah. or something and that's why it like you know most recipes it says like 50 50 you can do in the fact that that sourdough was 80 percent in those yeah. muffins that we just ate yeah like, i could awesome. if you had told me that it was whole wheat i wouldn't have known i was right. eating acorns i really should just pull the trigger on that one and just like try making a couple 100%. of things and see yeah you know and seeing how it works out i would be I mean, very interested to hear about that yeah yeah. Just something to bind it with, you know, an egg or something. Yeah, and I use the chia seeds, but I I heard that you can use plantain seeds at like a chia seed. So oh, basically, you make an egg. So plantain seeds, which are known as like a bulk laxative. Yeah. Um, like the dry. husk. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you can do the same thing with the dried plantain seeds as you would. You know, you can make like an egg like thing from flax mm-hmm. meal or mm-hmm. chia. It's mm-hmm. like that with the plantains. And the plantains you're talking about are not the um no, pan- no, banana not like the banana, the, the plantain the plant- plantains. Of course I'm I'm looking around, I surprise can't see there, any, but there I'm sure there are there. some. Yeah, over way over Yeah, they look like they're fat everywhere. spinach. With yes, the with the little stuff. stuff. Yeah, they're everywhere. Well, what um <laughs> We're nearing our, or we're nearing my point where I have to go be a father. Um, okay. Any last thoughts on acorns? Any any stuff that, um, you know, that you want to impart to the listeners or anything uh, we've, we've oh, missed? Oh, I did want to refer to back to Parable of the Sower by Octavia, Octavia Butler. Um, that something I really took away from that book, which is, a, as you mentioned, a post-apocalypse kind of city world breakdown uh she packed when she put together a um, lauren put together a survival bag a bug out bag to like she made sure she had a bag of acorn flour in there because that was gonna get them through so um i don't know i just that's kind of the way she also mentioned that acorn food was home food so she really thought of um it made her feel uh you know, home cooking. It makes you feel happy and satisfied. And, um, so. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There were, there were, that's kind of how, at this point, that's how I feel about acorns. I know I'm going to do something with them every year, even if that's simply muffins a few times, you know. So. Yeah. It's definitely a nice, practice to have it is it's like a practice to do a little bit and if if there's ever you know if i'm ever in a situation where i need to grow more or all of my own calories Mm -hmm. i know the acorns will be like a a much larger part of my diet exactly because they're just exactly yep but yeah, it's also just about like developing those practices and rooting our life to those um, cycles of the earth. Hey, yeah. hey, y'all, we're trying to record. Right? <laughs> uh, what kind what of bird is that? What do you have to say about What is that? It's a it's a little um, nuthatch. Yeah, nuthatch. And I think they're more insect eaters, right? Yeah. Or, so maybe they would. They, they're telling us. Um, about that acorn weevil and what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> a secondary consumer of acorns. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I like it as like the first, ste- like one of the first steps to becoming like you know in tune with your surroundings and like it is, developing right. And as you were just saying before, we were so rudely interrupted. No, <laughs> you were um, so pleasantly interrupted. You were saying um, this, getting it, being in touch with the cycle of the seasons. It's sort of like you start to hear those acorns fall. The air starts to get crisp, and then it's time to to harvest that. And then, you know, just same way with some of us, how we feel about maple syrup season. You start there starts to be that change in weather. It's time to tap some trees, and that's kind of it's part of being in touch with where you live. Even if you live in a city, you know, there's um, being in touch with the seasons. So. 
Yeah. yeah. And especially in cities like <clears throat> city parks and suburban lawns mm-hmm. are like the easiest places to collect acorns mm-hmm. um, because of that mowed grass. Like if you're picking up acorns out in the woods, you're picking them up off of like a significant amount of leaf litter, which is fine. Uh, but when they're just like on a lawn, it's a, yeah, a, the, the it's a breeze. The, the back side of the Museum of Fine Arts. Yeah. Great acorns. Yeah, or along the Arbor Way in Boston. Is yes. Great place yes, to look for acorns. Yes, exactly. Yep. Yeah, I mean, well, the cool thing about this, like, for instance, like, the path in my house is, like, I have a path now that we've made that was, like, started as a winter path for maple syrup, and then there's acorns along the way, and so it's, like, fun, you know, we have, like, our little opening, yeah. you know, forager path, and then I just discovered ground nuts all over the river behind my house, and, uh, and so I'm, like, okay, well, now i got to get all the way to the river, and, yeah. uh be able to just harvest them on foot because it's like literally the whole Androscoggin was just covered with ground nuts and I just couldn't I couldn't believe it wow, wow. so yeah there's a lot of cool stuff Very along the Androscoggin that's where I uh, ran into that um, balsam poplar it's like right I'm on the I'm going there next Wednesday to see that thing cool I, yeah, I put I put it on my mask and it made my uh, face mask smell really nice. And yes, was like your mask is really gross. It's got this orange <laughs> shit. And I'm like, yeah, but like smell it. It's, it's nice, nice. It's like it doesn't smell like garlic and coffee. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I don't know. Is there? Um, I should leave soon. So I'm just wondering, um, what do you think, Lisa? Is there, um, if people want to get in touch with you? Yeah, my Instagram account is a great way. Mm-hmm. So you post a lot of this stuff on there too. I do. Yeah, I, I don't really use Facebook, so that's. Um, yeah, and what what is your Instagram handle? Okay, it's, it's, um, it's Lisa underscore Willie underscore spelled out. Oh, could, really? you, could you spell Willie too? <laughs> W-I-L-L-E-Y. Oh, that's why it's spelled Willie. Yeah. Not Wiley. Right. Or pronounced, I should say. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, I always like to ask people if they recommend any books. It, it could be mm. your favorite uh, Dune novel. It doesn't really matter. Oh. Just like shouting out books. Uh, Octavia Butler. <laughs> <laughs> Parable of the Sower. Uh uh, um, I like Pascal Bodar's Instagram account for wild food because even though he's living in Los Angeles, you can still um, find some of the same types of things or some of the same types of processes here. Um, although he is more complicated than a lot. Um, there's an Instagrammer called Foraged by Fern and she's living in the UK somewhere, but I've You've done a lot of different ideas that she's had, just really similar things. So. Yeah, I've been following Giant Daughter from Upstate Giant Daughter, Maine, yep. Um, yep. And uh, the stuff they're doing is really cool, too. Yep. Nice. Exactly. She used yep. to live in that shack. Right? Yeah. Yep. Well, she's cool. Yeah. She's very cool. Yeah. So, uh, Especially yeah, like there's a lot of people. Especially coastal foraging. She posts a lot of really interesting stuff. Yeah, she she posted something about salt wort the other day, and I was like, ah, oh, I missed it. I can't. Yeah. It's in my books. I don't know where to get it. We actually did salt water um, in August. We got some salt water and cooked it in my maple syrup. And <laughs> made some salt. I, I did the same thing. After yeah. reading Pascal Balder, he had yeah. in, in his <laughs> new book, he had like a uh, making a marinade out of ocean water and I was like wait it's that easy that's how it makes all that easy? Yes. yes and it's really high um we got 0.85 cups out of a gallon mm-hmm. of seawater wild it's amazing we should yep. try and get that guy on the podcast Pascal, Pascal. Yeah, Pascal. Should. I know I'll just hit him up um and yeah the I mean, uh, why not? <laughs> the salt the 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 all the pickles I made with that salt mm-hmm. was like turned into club soda i just could it was like exploding salty shit. sauce it's it's so very cool. salty and delicious there's so many other flavors in the sea salt and everyone commented on like whoa that salt is really good and i was like <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> that's right Mom. it's not just salt it's the yeah. local terroir terroir <laughs> <laughs> awesome well this is Propaganda by the Seat, signing off.
use the coupon code SOULCAST at checkout at Edgewood Nursery to get 10% off your fall order. And by the time you hear this, the uh, all the sort of fall clearance stuff should be listed. All the, all the fall clearance inventory should be listed. So if you want to get some some plants for fall planting, now's a good time. And by the time you hear this, there's still plenty of time to gather acorns. Oh, right. definitely. And autumn berries and uh, stinging nettle and ground nuts and whatever else you can afford. Dog seeds. Dog seeds. Thank uh-huh.